Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. Long-standing listeners will have heard me chat to Walter Zapatachny before. In episode 57, we looked at the Ardennes Offensive and in episode 63, we looked at the German Penal Battalions. Patrons of the podcast might recall on both occasions, after I'd finished recording, we got to talking about the Italians in North Africa. Well, Walter's book on the topic was released a couple of months ago, The Italian Army in North Africa, A Poor Fighting Force or Doomed by Circumstance. And hopefully we can answer the question, A Poor Fighting Force or Doomed by Circumstance, in today's discussion. But before we get to that, with Christmas coming, why not treat yourself next year for just a dollar or two or whatever change you have in your virtual pocket, you can become a patron of the podcast and in doing so, treat yourself to extra World War II talk, chat from guests that never made it into the main podcast. You can find out more at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. Not only that, you'll be helping me bring a veritable feast of World War II podcast listening to next year with topics such as the SES in Italy, Anzio, Otto Scorzeni, Hitler's favourite commando, D-Day and the Heinkel HE-177. So that is patreon.com slash ww2podcast to sign up. Right, so Walter, um, welcome back. Um, we, we're going to be discussing the Italians in North Africa and trying to assess their uh, performance. But before we get to that, I think we need to look at the Italian forces. I I guess we could say their war started um, 1936. There's a huge contingent sent to Ethiopia. When people say the Germans learned a lot from the Spanish Civil War, can the same be said for the Italian army um, fighting in East Africa? Well, I, th I think they learned from both, both Spain and from Ethiopia. And I think there became a realization that they were not prepared production-wise, production of armaments-wise for either of those wars. You know, the Eth Ethiopian battle went pretty well for them. Um, their weapons were much more um, sophisticated than the average Ethiopian had. Uh, although there were some, uh, there were some pretty fierce fighting on the Ethiopian side, and they had some weapons too. But I think they, they had an essential lack of resources, and they didn't allocate what they did have sufficiently in both wars. They could no longer anticipate, uh, you know, having unlimited resources. It just it just wasn't part of it. The, the, the armaments industry, the production folks could not keep up with what Mussolini envisioned, I think some of his planners envisioned. And I think some of the people were telling him that, you know, we can't do it. But, you no, know, we can do it. We're going to do it. One of the things they did is they reorganized their divisions into uh, two infantry regiments instead of three as a result of both Ethiopia and Spain. And, and they thought that uh, this would make them more mobile. Um, the problem with that is, yes, but you have to have the uh, equipment to be mobile with. And again, it comes back to the production part of it. They, they couldn't keep up. They couldn't make enough armored personnel carriers. They couldn't make enough uh, trucks. They couldn't make enough tanks. Couldn't, it couldn't make enough uh, uh, howitzers, uh, guns, large guns. Does that make a division smaller? Do you have the same amount of men in it? it it's just organized into... It, it actually makes it smaller. And again, the idea was to make it more mobile, and, and which is wonderful. I mean, the United States did the same, does the same thing, you know. But you know, in the American Army and in the British Army, I'm sure, uh, they have the equipment <laughs> to make it happen. You know, the Italian just couldn't. In, the Italian industry just couldn't do it. I mean, as much as they wanted to do it, and they they knew they needed the equipment, uh, Italian industry just couldn't keep up. I mean, I wondered if coming out of uh, uh, out, out of certainly uh, Ethiopia, if they had a strange false sense of security, because obviously they they had won over something that was a that had been a national humiliation, but they had an absolutely overwhelming force in many respects, which looked great for Mussolini when he's uh, you know we've won. And then it perhaps leads them down the road of uh, overconfidence. I think so. And I think there's evidence of overconfidence as we go through this entire North African campaign on, on all fronts, on, on, on all parties. <laughs> we could talk about some of that. <laughs> yes, I, I, did, I did think that. Now, you state there were, there were worse equipped than the First World War. I wondered how that could even be possible. 
I mean, were they were they that under equipped? Well, uh, the the equipment that they did have was, uh, in most cases, World War One vent or earlier vintage, and of course they're fighting um, in the case of. Uh, uh, the British in North Africa, of course, they're fighting uh, more advanced weapons. And so um, they didn't have any artillery pieces that would fire uh, further than five miles, for instance, where the British had large howitzers that could go 15, 20, 25 miles, right? And and even further, when the Americans came in and started bringing some of their heavy guns in, the Germans had those guns. So, you know, that's just examples of what I was talking about there. I mean, it's a horse-drawn artillery. In many cases, horses don't do real well in the sand, in the desert. They were just weren't ready. In North Africa, the British are obviously there uh, in Egypt, certainly for um, – because the strategic importance of the Suez Canal. Why are the Italians in uh, North Africa? And why do they have designs on it? Well, I think uh, with the German successes that were occurring there uh, early on, uh, Mussolini intended that uh, Hitler keep his forces basically in the north and uh, – Italy would control the Mediterranean. Mussolini was concerned that Italy might lose uh, some of the spoils of this because he envisioned an early uh, victory, an early end to the war. You know, he wanted to be he wanted to be part of the on the winning side and part of it. Yeah, it's, 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 it, I did. You know, they they commit themselves to the British, and it's they when they do so, it is with um, with a huge. It's the Tenth Army. Is is think it's 150,000 men is that right when they eventually cross yeah something like that yeah. um, it's an enormous commitment um crosses that Ita- egyptian frontier in um uh, 1940 1940 40 correct yeah you know, they cross the frontier and then they seem to as you said they don't go very far and stop what why are they not pushing on it's such a strange thing it's almost like a lackluster they didn't i don't think they felt that they had the uh equipment that they needed to take on the british at that point so they needed more from the mainland at which point why did you cross that frontier to start with <laughs> well i mean a lot of them walked across that frontier well you know well <laughs> Yeah, and, and they're doing twelve miles a day, which is, I imagine, I mean, it's not it's, it's not blistering uh, performance, but in the in the heats, carrying everything, um, they were probably it's st- tough. Huh? It's, it's tough. <laughs> I've, I've been to I've been to Egypt uh, when I was in the military. Uh, I, I was there for a little while, and uh, I have a picture somewhere of uh, somebody's watch that has a, thermo- a temperature thing on it, and it reads almost one hundred and twenty eight degrees. So, you know, you get days like that in Egypt and North Africa, and uh, that's tough. You're carrying all this equipment. They were worn down. You know, they needed to recoup a little bit and refresh and get some reinforcements, which they never really, never really gotten until the time that uh, Rommel showed up with his reinforcements. Was the attack undertaken under, for political reasons, or was it that the military deemed they could make the attack? Well, Mussolini wanted to control the Mediterranean, and but but when at that time when they went in September forty, they felt they could do it because they felt they could surprise the British. The British they didn't fill the British with think they could they would do it. They had their successes in Ethiopia, you know, and uh, to some degree in uh, the Spanish Civil War. Uh, that's a pretty good performance. And so um, there we go. If we get the if we get the reinforcements, we're going to knock. The, we're going to take the British out of uh, Egypt, and we'll have control of the Suez Canal. Which leads us to possibly the one of the most forgotten uh, or overlooked British uh, victories of the war, which is just stunning. Um, which is Operation Compass, which which basically routes the Italian army. I mean, I mean that's probably the way to way to put it. Why? What was the failure of the Italian army? Well, again, a lot of it has to come back it's to th- equipment. Thirty thousand British yeah. troops. Thirty thousand British troops. I mean, it's against one hundred fifty thousand. It's well. The other thing we have to rem- remember too that the bulk of the Italian forces were not trained for desert warfare. They were trained for mountain warfare. In addition, uh, they were using the M eleven thirty nine tank, which was poorly armored, didn't do well in the sand, was unreliable, uh, a lot of downtime. The Italian 10th Army was composed of four corps, but only one unit um, that General Berti had uh, was not an infantry division, and it was only partially mobilized, lightly armored. British had the cruiser tank, the Matilda, superior to the Italian armor. And, of course, you have to look at the British um, tactics. Uh, Hobart's methods of maneuver 
that he had convinced um, all the powers to be that should be used enabled the British to outmaneuver the Italians. And of course, as a result of that, the British saying, well, you know what? Now we, we can, we can work, we can beat these guys. We can outmaneuver them. I mean, we're superior. So it kind of goes right into this, uh, you know, um, uh, idea that uh, we're unstoppable. You know? Yeah. That idea of we're winning does make, make for super soldiers because it is just uh, victory after victory. Because what, what amazes me with so many men, the Italians have that, that they don't seem to be able to soak up, uh, soak up you'd have thought they'd be able to take enough punishment with 150,000 men to at least stand their ground but it, it it's just a collapse it is just... well again we're, we're out, they're being out maneuvered by very fast uh, equipment uh you know it's like uh, the tanks are draw, running circles around them so to speak yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah and I, as you say i i do th- i think this sort of becomes a, I, I, becomes a problem for the british b- believing you know it, it's great for them on the offensive when they're winning but when obviously it stiffens with the arrival of Rommel, there, uh, there it's perhaps becomes a bit of a a, 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 a lead weight around their neck um, when they can't understand why they're no longer winning. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, Rom, Rommel, uh, the British um, did not think Rommel was ready to attack when he when he came with the uh, and it wasn't even the full amount of what turned out to be the Africa Corps, but some of the troops, when he attacked, he came over. Um, they figured it's going to take him months to regroup, to set his, his, his plans in place. Well, what's he do? He attacks right away, and he catches the British completely off guard. They never thought he was going to do that. You know, they established uh, with the Italians now, with the Italian army and their allies, the besieging the Allied fortress at Trebuch, you know. I mean, what Rommel arrives, as does Italy. I mean, you only ever hear of the, the, the Rommel and the Africa arriving, but at the same time, the Italians are sending over some superb reinforcements, aren't they? Well, absolutely. Now, remember, Rommel answer, was, um, was sent there by Hitler, but he answered to the Italian Commando Supremo in Rome. So he was under Italian control. And as a result... He would go back through Commando Supremo for reinforcements, for fuel, for ammo. In fact, when he left North Africa back in um, October 25th, 42, he went to Rome to get more ammunition and more fuel for the for the campaign. You know, of course, that's later than this period. But so he was he stayed under their control for some time, which they, which he resented. Of course, he felt that they they um, they asked too many questions. They really limited his ability to maneuver. Uh, they did not want him to attack when he did attack the British when he first got there. They wanted him to, in fact, do what he thought the British thought he was going to do, and that was to build up his force, get a good plan put together, get more troops on the ground. He looked around and says, "No, I'm not doing that." He says, "We're going to attack right now," and that was his style. So, how was how did this command structure work? Could it? It was Rommel commanding Italian troops, or did he have to ask the command, Italian commander in the field to go with them? No, he commanded Italian troops. There were uh, the Italian units that were assigned to, which became the uh, Deutsches Afrika Corps, um, and they were part of it. In fact, the Italians made up a large portion of, of, the, of the combat power. Uh, forty-one, forty-two. Well, there, there it's, uh, and it is. There were very much more in the in the in the majority. I think uh, at this at this well through through the whole lot. I think weren't they? The, the, the Germans really were the minority group on the uh, axis in North Africa. That's correct. A lot of people uh, don't realize that. They think that the, when the Germans came over, they've come over with all these people, and they just assume they just took over. That's not the case at all. Well, I this comes back to what I, I wondered if it's actually a good PR campaign by the British to say, look, we beat the Italians, but when the Germans start doing well, you can't say, oh, the Italians are doing quite well now. So you have to pull another bogeyman out of the hat. So you go, oh, the Germans, are, it's the Germans that we're losing against, not the Italians. Um, so right. it, it becomes a problem. <laughs> uh, uh, and actually, that lives with us today. So we forget that the, when the Germans came over, the Italians were still fighting with them. And there's a lot of them. The Germans are still fighting. The Italians are still fighting with them. The uh, Eritrea division uh, had some um, uh, some good successes in, in Tobruk and other places. Uh, uh, you know, in, in December, between November and December 42, they took over 5000 English and New Zealand prisoners. Took in, they took part of the th- in the three skirmishes of El Alamein, you know. Uh, other divisions as well, the Fogor division, the paratroopers, uh, they fought, uh, driving off attacks by the New Zealand infantry, who were very good. They, they were um, 
they made a name for themselves. And, you know, again, they were part of the Deutsches Afrika Corps. So uh, one might look at that and say, well, the Afrika Corps did all this. Well, yeah, but they were part of the Afrika Corps. <laughs> I mean, they weren't fighting alone, you know. I, I, I did. I did make a question. I did make a, a, a note that's with, with a list of Italian uh, units, and it goes decimated, destroyed, and fought till out of ammunition, and then they surrendered. Uh, which, which is not the uh, idea that we have from earlier in the war, where they just s- surrendered uh, at, at the first opportunity. They, they really, you know, they did have some uh, metal when they were uh, when when they were where they were fighting uh, how did do we know how the german units the italian units worked uh, together do we know how they viewed one another well the germans were suspect of the italians but as time went on uh, many of the uh, german commanders wrote very favorably of uh, italian units um, y- you know it's like any any unit i mean not every unit's the best you know some are worse than others but for the most part uh, there were a lot of accolades pushed forth towards the um, towards the German or towards the Italian units, not so much their commanders. The Germans never did believe that the Italian commanders really knew what they were doing. They were not good leaders. They, they didn't, they just didn't have what it in the Germans minds, what it took to be a good leader. But the, the Italian soldier, on the other hand, when given equipment, given uh, the mission, given clear orders, fought well. And, and that's one of the reasons I wrote this book because i i wanted to to get that across that you know there's this there's this idea that's out there that the germans that the um the germans did all the fighting and the italians surrendered as soon as they could that's just not the case no and i also made a note about you know when when we're looking at later in the war with the wide scale surrendering i mean how much of that was actually there weren't so much surrendered as they were on foot and basically the the allies drove past them. <laughs> well, yes. And, and you know, their, their tanks are gone for the most part. Their trucks are gone. Um, so they're in the desert. They're out of food. W- what are they going to do at this point? They're going to stand up and say, you know, die to the last man. I mean, they're not going to do that. Remember the average soldier, Italian soldier was not quite as enthusiastic about the cause as, as Mussolini was, or certainly the, or the Germans were. And they didn't, they didn't really think of it as their war. They really didn't. They're, they're there. They're following orders. They, they weren't. Uh, there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm. But they fought, and they fought bravely. Did they have any political? You know, the Germans have the SS. Did the Italians have any political combat units? And did if so, did they perform any uh, better? The black shirts uh, units, uh, and there were some elements in North Africa and uh, paratroopers. You know, and they did well. They did well. Were they? I don't know anything about Falgor. The Italian Falgor had uh, black shirts. I forget what the name of the units were that were with them, but uh, they had uh, they had units with them, I believe. Uh, so they they they, were, they weren't uh, a separate entity. They were enrolled in in in. That's right. They're integrated into the division structure. Right, 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 right. So, uh, how much of the Italian army do we think you know? To, uh, Moving to it was of question of a was of questionable ability. Is that if that's even a, not a lot too loaded a question? <laughs> I, I think it's how we how we define the questionable ability and how we look at that. Again, if we're if we're looking at equipment, type of equipment, training, leadership, many of that's questionable. If we're looking at the individual soldier. Excuse me, and his his willingness to fight. Um, that's another thing. Did they use troops from their colonies, native troops? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of Indians. The British used a lot of Indians in uh, in North Africa. I don't know if the Italians. Uh, I think they had some from Ethiopia in there, but it wasn't a significant portion. Right. Right, because you know, I don't know. My assumption was they might not well as, have, have performed as, as well, uh, assuming because they'd be even. Wor- if the Italians were poorly equipped, uh, the colonial troops might be even worse. <laughs> yeah, equipped. exactly. They're not, they're not going to have the best weapons, <laughs> even though they, they, none of them had the best weapons anyway. But. Uh, which is, which is, because that's one of those. For, you know, the, the Indians in North Africa, in the British view of things, completely get overlooked, and they performed usually superbly. But that's not necessarily part of the uh, of the British uh, narrative of uh, of, North, of, uh, of the war in that part. See, you know, again, the the leadership was not trained for desert warfare. The, the, most of the people were trained for mountain warfare. Two totally different ways of fighting, 
And I would submit to you that had this war been fought, had these North African battles been fought in the mountains, I think the Italians would have done very, very well. <laughs> well, it's, I really well it's, it, I, it, it had never occurred to me, but, you know, Italian is, it's Italian, sorry. Italy is not known for, you know, enormous flat plains, which might be classed as tank country, which is all of North Africa, but it is known as a mountainous area. So why would its military necessarily be uh, trained for enormous flat plains and tanks zooming and about, mi- which is what? Hobart had done with the with the uh, British. Exactly. And many of uh, Mussolini's advisors advised him before even the Ethiopian campaign to wait. Let's get better training. Let's better uh, get better equipment that's suitable for the desert. And again, he was afraid that this war was going to be over soon. And, you know, and, and it was heading that direction. I mean, uh, most of Western Western Europe was uh, was under Br- uh, German control. The Battle of Britain uh, was still going on. And so it looked like it looked like the war was going to be over quickly. He he went he didn't want to lose out, so he said, "No, we're going to go with what we got." You know? Well, you've got that curious thing. If Mussolini hadn't done that, we might we would we the British wouldn't necessarily have been uh, fighting a land war with the Germans because we obviously dragged the Germans in. Other than that, we'd be staring across the channel at one another, and uh, it would be left to bomber command. Uh, and how things might have been different. One of the things I try to get across to my students is that as we look at these things that have occurred, you know, oftentimes it's one, one decision that changes the course of history. And one can look at wars, and especially this war, and, and see uh, so many things. I mean, if it wouldn't have been for the uh, stellar effort of the RAF, the Germans would have invaded southern England. If it wouldn't have been for Hitler's insistence on Stalingrad, uh, on and on and on, you know. But the, and, and you look at the big picture of these things; it's one decision, oftentimes, that makes the difference, doesn't it? It does. It does. It, it never really. That's. It, it had never really occurred to me if Mussolini hadn't been keen to get in, that might have. Uh, and, and I can't quite comprehend in my mind the uh, ramifications of that. Presumably, we'd have a better control of the Mediterranean. It would increase the power of the Royal Navy. I mean, there's all kinds of ramifications for it. The, ramica- ra- the ramifications for the Pacific War would be tremendous uh, with a with with, with uh, a secure to secure route through the Med. Um, oh, uh, those what if questions are always uh, <laughs> are always wonderful. I, I really enjoy having those uh, uh, perfor- uh, proposing those questions to my students because they, especially the ones that are really into it, you know, that really enjoy this. I mean, you just see the wheels turning, and you're thinking, "Oh yeah, what if? Yes, and what about? You know, <laughs> I think that's the that's the thing that I enjoy most about lecturing." <laughs> so, ultimately, I mean, were they a poor fighting force, or were they victims of circumstance? I'm not sure if the questions somehow loaded to you thinking they're victims of circumstances. What What do you think? Well, despite poor leadership. In my judgment, the Italian soldiers fought bravely, in many cases to the last man. I think they were doomed by circumstances beyond their control. Once again, um, the average Italian soldier was not as enthusiastic about the cause as Mussolini was. And and I'm not saying that in a negative way. Um, They certainly weren't as uh, committed as uh, as many of the German forces were. And and, and, uh, and not all of the Deutsches Afrika Corps were SS soldiers either. You know, um, uh, they lack transport, supplies, equipment, modern equipment, artillery. Their soldiers were trained uh, in, for the mountains. Was it beyond their control? And I think the reason that we can I can say that I I say that it, they were doomed by circumstances, because when you look at the individual units, you get down to that level and you see where the Italians fought and they fought bravely with the little bit that they did have. And in many cases to the last man. What if they would have had all the equipment? There's another what if for us to, to think about. What if they would have had modern equipment equivalent to, let's say, uh, the, what the British Army had in Egypt? What if they would have had equipment, an artillery equivalent to what Germany had? Who knows? They still might have been thrown out of North Africa eventually, but I think it had been a longer road to go 
for the British and even for the Americans when they came on board. Well, the, the, the oddity is even if they had the equipment, could they get it get there? Because, I mean, that was also the other... That's... Yes, of course. Yeah. The Italians weren't necessarily as committed at throwing their navy around in the Med uh, and possibly not as competent as the uh, British at doing so. So they were constantly waiting on supplies. And I think they flew a lot in as well, didn't they? Which They did fly a lot in. Yes, they did. Which now, is... A, yeah, hiding to nowhere, really, trying to move vast amounts of supplies like that. If uh, Mussolini would have waited and given the, war, the armaments industry a chance to catch up, who knows, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Knows? Interesting yeah. to think about. It is. I, you, 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 as I say, you've got my, my, my wheel spinning in my mind at what would have happened. Oh, you know, if, if you'd waited until after Pearl Harbor... <laughs> <laughs> there <laughs> yeah. might have been hardly anything left in Britain because we might have committed even more to the Pacific than we sort of uh, we did at the time because we were in you know stretched by them. I do have a um, a correction to make, and I'd like your 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 uh, followers to know this that it, um, General uh, Strom, who uh, was transferred from Russia to take Rommel's place, you know Rommel was ill. OK. And, it, and then on October 25th, 42, he flew to, to Rome to try to beg for more fuel and, and ammunition. Now, after um, that evening, um, British 10th Armored uh, attacked Matura Ridge. OK. Uh, General Strom went forward to observe the state of affairs, if you will. And, and he came under fire mm -hmm. and he had a heart attack and died mm. at the front. On page 90 of my book, there's a sentence that says Rommel went forward and died of a heart attack, and we all we all missed that somehow. <laughs> it should say Strom. So if anybody's reading catches that on page ninety, it, um, I'm correcting it right now. It should say Strom, not I'd, Rommel. I'd presume. Of course, he didn't die of a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> I'd I'd presumed. I knew that, but I I I presumed that I just got it was a, it was the uh, pre-publication release copy that I'd got that had got it in and it had been picked up. I can't uh, believe we all, we all missed that somehow. Just one of those things. <laughs> See, it, it shows that we're all human, you know. Uh, well, yes, uh, and, and, and that's this is where the spell checker sometimes, if it, it doesn't pick things up for some odd reason, you don't. Obviously, that's not a spell check, but you you can write drivel. Uh, that's right. Because you think it should be correct, and you read it as correct, even though it's not, and the spell check doesn't flag it. And it's miles out. Well, and that's why you always have to have somebody else look at your stuff because you know I'll look at something so long and it'll be totally wrong, and I'll look at it and say, "Oh, that's okay." You know? <laughs> I mean, you just have to step back from it and have somebody else look at it. So. Uh, well, yes, Walter, thank you for joining me, loyal listener. If you want to know more about the Italians in North Africa, the book is "The Italian Army in North Africa: A Poor Fighting Force or Doomed by Circumstance." As ever, I'll put a link on the website. Next time out, we'll be looking at Operation Crossbow, as chosen by you, the listener. If you missed it, I ran a poll on Patreon to give you the choice of which two topics I covered first. Crossbow got 56% of the vote to the Heinkel HE177's 44%. So it was a close run thing. Don't forget, for more nonsense between podcasts, you can find me on Facebook, www.podcast, or at Patreon, patreon.com slash www.podcast. That's it for now. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening.